Thank you very much, Marcus. And I would like to also start by extending a warm thank you and welcome to all our esteemed speakers and participants who are joining us at today's parliamentary dialogue. Uh, it will be on the impact of climate change on displacement and human security. My name is Shafak Pave, and I have the privilege of moderating today's discussion on behalf of Interparliamentary Union and UNECR. The impacts of climate change on natural resources, uh, livelihoods, and increased vulnerabilities surely leads to further displacement, but it doesn't get equally the same attention when it comes to national adapt adaptation support plans or disaster risk reduction strategies and measures. So certainly parliaments and parliamentary community play, uh, plays a very crucial role in responding to climate change, displacement, and building also a long-term resilience for both host communities as well as the, those that are, who are forcibly displaced refugees, internally displaced persons. So therefore, in close partnership with Interparliamentary Union, we wanted to open a parliamentary dialogue on this, particularly to focus on the link linkages between climate change, displacement, and human security. Before our deep dive to the matter, I would like to invite Assistant Secretary General and UNHCR's Assistant High Commissioner for Protection, Ms. Gillian Triggs, to deliver her welcoming remarks to you all. The floor is yours, Gillian. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shafak. And may I say what a great pleasure it is uh, for me and my colleagues uh, to be part of this parliamentary dialogue on this very important question uh, of the impact of climate change on displacement and human security. Um, I'm, I've been very, uh, I'm very honoured to be able to be one of the first speakers with my colleague Martin Chungong, uh, who was to, to speak with me. Um, he's actually not able to be with us exactly at this dialogue other uh, than through um, a video after I speak. Uh, the reason is that he's actually engaged with the UN General Assembly uh, which in various speeches, of course, is considering exactly the same question that we're looking at today on the impact of climate change on displacement. So when I said I, I'm particularly pleased to, to speak to parliamentarians uh, in, in, in this dialogue context, it's because it's become now a critical um, emergency uh, for us to consider preparedness and prevention, access to services and means of building resilience for displaced people and for their host populations that are affected by the climate emergency. But I stress parliamentarians because it's very clear to us at UNHCR that we need to be focused in, in our advocacy work because many of the responses, not all of course, but many responses to climate emergencies are ones that parliamentarians uh, are most uh, almost uniquely placed to uh, ensure. Uh, they are, of course, uh, the uh, primary body responsible for translating international treaties and obligations into national law. But they also, of course, are pivotal in ensuring that we have the relevant policies and adaptation uh, and resilience policies in place. So our partnership at UNHCR with the Interparliamentary Union is vital. Uh, and this parliamentary dialogue on um, solidarity in forced displacements is particularly important. One question that some might ask is, well, why is UNHCR, a, a refugee agency, concerned about the impacts of climate change? And the answer is that today's climate crisis has created an international refugee protection crisis because climate change and climate crises have a disproportionate impact on the most vulnerable people, especially those who've been forcibly displaced from their homes by climate change. UNHCR's role, of course, is to ensure international protection to people seeking safety in another, usually or often, uh, neighbouring country, or who are displaced within their own country. And today, the High Commissioner for Refugees, Philippa Grandi, has reported over 100 million people are displaced uh, in these two contexts. Of course, it varies, and the impact of climate, it varies from region to region. Some might suffer devastating uh, droughts uh, with the fifth consecutive failed rainy season in the whole, uh, eastern horn of Africa, but others face record breaking rains and floods, as we've seen so recently uh, with the devastating and tragic consequences in Pakistan. So extreme weather events like these that were once considered exceptional 
should now be expected. And unfortunately, they're only likely to become more severe as time goes on. And there are a couple of examples I'd like to mention. Uh, one is, and both of them, in fact, are both uh, are early this year. Uh, the first is, is Mozambique. Uh, has been battered by five tropical storms in one year and cyclones along its northern coastal borders, affecting thousands of families, including refugees and people who've already been displaced by the ongoing violence in the northern province of Cabo Delgado. And the other example concerns the drought in Somalia. Um, Again, this year, thousands of people have been displaced after three consecutive failed rainy seasons that decimated crops and livestock, forcing thousands to flee their homes, searching humanitarian assistance, food, shelter, and safe drinking water. Some people also ask, are these displaced people climate refugees in the classical legal uh, terms of the Refugee Convention? Are they fleeing conflict or violence or persecution? Well, to answer this is very complex because climate change has a multiplier effect that can lead to conflicts over arable land, feed for stocks and access to water. And that in turn, of course, leads to yet further displacement. While it's true that overwhelmingly people are displaced by war and conflict or criminal violence, it's also true that over 80% of refugees and displaced people are displaced by conflict and violence from the most climate vulnerable countries Globally, Somalia, Sudan, Afghanistan, and Yemen are just a few examples. So there is a correlation, in other words, between those people who become refugees due to displacement and the vulnerability of the countries from which they come to climate, uh, extreme climate events. Well, as many of you will know, the Global Compact on Refugees, um, of course, accepted within or by the members of the uh, General Assembly, is UNHCR's guiding star for our strategy over the coming years. And one of those principles concerns the equitable sharing of responsibility for refugees. And it reflects the the reality that about 85% of people forcibly displaced from their homes are in fact hosted in low and middle income countries, many of which are highly vulnerable to climate change. Many of these countries have been stepping up and providing protection for those forced to flee, but they're now facing really almost insuperable challenges as cascading climate impacts threaten their ability to be resilient. And these impacts undermine the development gains that have been made in those countries. But the other critical feature of the Global Compact on Refugees is that it recognized that climate, environmental degradation and disasters interact with the main drivers of the refugee movement. And so it's in that spirit that UNHCR now has a strategic framework for climate action, which emphasizes the need to work with states, with governments, of course, parliamentarians and our partners to develop laws and policies that ensure the protection of all those displaced in the context of climate change. So in summary, we haven't got a choice. Given what our teams from UNHCR uh, across 580 Uh, offices and field operations see on the ground daily, and of course what science is telling us, we must step up our efforts to support the most vulnerable, to be better prepared for the impacts of accelerating climate emergencies. We need to strengthen our anticipatory action and to give people a chance to mitigate the impact of the climate shocks that we now know are on their way. I'm really pleased by the very rich Experience is brought by the panelists today, uh, and I look forward to um, hearing uh, how they describe uh, the special responsibility that parliamentarians have in ensuring the sustainable development goal commitment that we leave no one behind. Can I say then thank you firstly for, for organizing this, this dialogue through the Interparliamentary Union and to confirm that the UN Refugee Agency is committed to deepening our engagement with parliamentarians, to gain their support, to ensure that we have the commitments at all levels, global, regional, and national, uh, to ensure that we've got the legal and policy frameworks in place to allow us all to reduce the risks and to mitigate the effects, but of course, ultimately, to protect uh, those people most affected by climate change. 
Uh, so thank you very much. And I'll pass back to Shafak, if, if I may. Thank you, Gillian. We would like to thank you. Uh, and uh, without further ado, actually, we would like to move to Martin Chungong, Secretary General of Interparliamentary Union, who is currently participating at the United Nations General Assembly in New York. Uh, with his apologies, he couldn't join us live today, but has delivered his uh, remarks in a video message. Thank you. It is a great pleasure for me to welcome you to this parliamentary dialogue on the impact of climate change on displacement and human security with the special advisor for climate action to the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. I would like to thank UNHCR for co-organizing this event with the IPU. This is an important opportunity to bring the voice of parliaments to the table on this extremely important topic. There is no escaping the fact that climate change is now a global existential threat. Devastating floods, droughts and wildfires have become all too common sites. If climate change continues on its current path, there is no corner of the globe that will be spared. In 2021, an estimated 24 million men and women, boys and girls, were internally displaced due to climate disasters. Climate change was behind many of those. It is also making it increasingly harder to sustain livelihoods and is pushing people further into poverty, increasing food insecurity and wiping away hard-earned development gains. We know that it is the most vulnerable populations that face the greatest risks and refugees and internally displaced men and women, boys and girls who have left their homes behind are even more vulnerable than others. We also know that the great majority of forcibly displaced men and women are hosted by countries that are heavily affected by global warming, placing an additional challenge on host communities and making it more difficult to provide protection and inclusion. The links between climate change, displacement and human security are obvious, but nevertheless complex. These challenges need to be addressed together when looking at prevention, mitigation and adaptation responses and strategies. And we cannot wait any longer. Research tells us that climate-related disasters could double the number of people requiring humanitarian assistance to over 200 million each year by 2050 if ambitious climate action and disaster risk reduction is not undertaken. Displacement is also occurring at a faster pace than the creation of sustainable solutions. What are some of the responses we need to consider? Respect for international humanitarian law and human rights law is a priority. Parliaments have a critical role to play in ensuring human rights mechanisms and refugee protection measures, including the Global Compact on Refugees, are implemented and enforced through strong national legislation. Climate and displacement responses must also go hand in hand in policy making. Parliaments can ensure that agreements and commitments on both issues are jointly addressed and translated into comprehensive national legislation that thoroughly recognizes the interlinkages between climate and displacement and the impact of climate change on displaced populations and host communities. They can ensure adequate budgetary allocations are made available to support climate change adaptation and to provide support to those who have been displaced and those who host displaced communities. As representatives of the people, 
parliaments must represent displaced constituents and use political platforms to raise awareness of their situation and advocate for the rights. Access to protection and assistance in the face of emergency situations as well as in the face of slow onset climate stressors is also keen. Attention must be paid to building resilience in the long term. It is not only about responding to crises, but also about being proactive to avoid crises that lead to or impact displacement in the first place. The Interparliamentary Union, with its membership of 178 national parliaments, has made addressing climate change a top priority. Tackling the climate crisis at the heart of the new IPU strategy for 2022-2026. The strategy includes a special focus on strengthening the inclusion of marginalized and vulnerable populations whom we know are the most at risk of displacement or hardest hit by climate change. Earlier this year, the IPU member parliaments endorsed the Nusa Dua Declaration, which explicitly, explicitly recognizes the growing threat of climate-related displacement, particularly in resource-scarce conflict situations. It calls for the upholding of rights of persons displaced by climate change and for parliamentarians to reflect climate-related displacement issues in national laws and to guarantee accountability when rights are violated. Last year, the IPU and the Adaptation at Altitude program co-organized a global webinar on climate change and forced migration in mountain areas to explore possibilities or opportunities for enhancing Parliament's role in aligning and harmonizing national policies on climate change, disasters, and human mobility. The event placed particular emphasis on the importance of ensuring that climate-related displacement was addressed across policy areas and that principles of protection and inclusion were prioritized. The active participation of displaced persons in both policy making and implementation of solutions to address displacement and climate change was also stressed. Colleagues, the time for action is now. We must build on this momentum and work together to strengthen parliamentary engagement and capacity to address this issue. At the upcoming parliamentary meeting at COP27, we expect the interlinkages between climate change and displaced populations to be an important point of discussion. The, web the webinar that we are holding today offers a much needed platform for parliaments to learn from each other on critical climate, displacement and human security issues. I think this is an excellent opportunity for honest, critical dialogue on the challenges and opportunities for parliaments to take a leading role in identifying solutions to this monumental challenge. I look forward to the outcomes of the discussion and wish you a most fruitful event. We also would like to thank Secretary General Chungong for giving us an overview uh, globally on the parliamentary efforts on this front. And uh, without again further ado, we have a very rich panel today with our esteemed parliamentarian speakers who will share with us their perspectives and scene setting remarks uh, right after an initial briefing that UN High Commissioner, our special advisor, Mr. Andrew Harper, who will give us an overview, a briefing on our strategies on the displacement and, and climate action. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Suffolk, and um, and also very thankful to the IPU, the Secretary General, uh, Martin Chungong, um, our own Assistant High Commissioner for Protection, but also all the people who have joined us today, because 
What I think is particularly important when we're um, talking about a dialogue and we're talking about the interparliamentary um, union is that it's not only that we're looking at the translation of, let's say, international practice, um, respect for human rights, but it's parliamentarians who are the linkage, uh, the nexus between the communities and national decision making. And I think um, like what has been said to date is, is perfectly correct. Um, there's been a there's been a lot of discussions, particularly at UNGA, about the um, the urgency, the, the need to be doing more. But it's going to be at the community level and the national level where, where the difference is being made. And so the the role of parliamentarians, uh, their engagement, their identification of not only the problems, but the solutions, and to ensure that when we look at solutions, it ensures that no one is not, not only is no one left behind, but that um, we're dealing with um, the respect and dignity um, of populations. And this is what parliamentarians um, have a role and responsibility for. So I'll try and keep this relatively short because I also think it's it's super important that we listen to people who represent the front line. And that's Christine from Uganda. We've got Ramina uh, from Pakistan, Amira from Egypt, um, Anissa from Chad and Catherine um, good friend Catherine from um, from France. So that being said, um, I'd just like to move forward and say how important it is to be um, working with the Inter Intermediary Parliamentary Union. And I'll push through this um, relatively quickly because it's just to sort of give you a, an overview, a scene setting of what um, of what UNHCR is, is doing and why it's engaged. And Julian has been able to succinctly and articulately uh, reference the fact that climate change is multiplying uh, and exacerbating vulnerabilities and challenges across the board. And unfortunately, what um, evidence and science and data is showing us is that over the next several decades, 60, 70 years, the world is unfortunately going to get warmer. We can't turn that back. Um, the emissions have increased to such, an, a, such a state that it's now really um, not only a, a question of reducing emissions, but supporting those populations which are particularly vulnerable to adapt to this extremely uh, worrying, challenging, threatening environment, but also to be prepared. And so this is where working with national authorities, um, supporting adaptation, uh, looking at questions of loss and damage is just so important. And this is why it's also great to have a mirror here uh, because there's nothing more important than looking at uh, the issue of loss and damage uh, going into COP27, because it's not just um, the issue of climate change, it's also the reference that the vast majority of countries which are on the front lines of the climate change and have got the least um, basically responsibility for, for the mess that's occurred, but they're also demonstrating this, this degree of international solidarity, which very few in the West have, have demonstrated. So it's not only the, the, the smart thing to do, it's the right thing to do. And this is why we need to be working with communities in order to um, ensure that the protection is maintained. Um, the issue of, um, of climate vulnerability, I won't necessarily go, go into it too much because I think it's fairly um, straightforward, but people have been displaced by conflict are generally the populations that are located on the margins of, let's say, habitable um, land. They have the least resources in which to adapt. Um, but there's also the, the populations which have generously opened their doors, uh, the governments who have provided them with protection. So we need to be ensuring that these populations are, are not doubly hit by having to, um, one, flee conflict, but are then having to um, adapt to the, an increasingly hostile climate. And so this is why UNHCR with our partners are not stepping back. We have to be doing much more in terms of advocacy. We need to be doing much more in terms of supporting governments, communities in trying to see what can make a difference. And I'm not talking about pilots and photo opportunities of small little projects. We need to be seeing what is it that governments require to be better prepared to enter the 2030s, the 2040s? Um, we already know that the SDGs are in really um, 
a state of crisis, but what can we be doing other than talking and having panels and, and meetings? Uh, so I'm really looking forward to COP27 to sort of saying to people who would like to be on the podiums, what difference have you made? Not what are you going to do? What have you made since the last COP? Um, in terms of um, events, and again, we're seeing Pakistan at the moment, but we're also seeing the situation in, in the Horn of Africa. We're seeing it in Arid Corridor in Central America. And I'm keeping an eye on, on the, the chat function because what is really um, rewarding is just seeing the global audience who are tuning into this. So this is no longer a byproduct or a sort of a, uh, a side discussion. This is very much at the heart of global security. And you can't have global security or regional security unless you have human security. And if we look at the situation in Pakistan as an example, you have floods, but it's going to take months for those floods to, to, to decrease. And what's going to happen after that? What's going to happen to food security? What's going to happen to the health situation? What's going to be happening to the governance? So across the board, we need to be looking at um, how do we support adaptation preparedness, but also how do we ensure that populations um, are more resilient in order to deal with this, this basically ratcheting up of climate crises? Um, we're seeing it on a daily basis. Um, Julian mentioned that the, we've got 580 officers around the world. Uh, there's probably no one better than the communities on the ground to understand some of the challenges than UNHCR officers who have to try and demonstrate to local authorities, to the refugees, to the displaced, um, that the world cares. And I'm not too sure that they care enough at the moment. And this has been continually reiterated by, by the Secretary General, by the High Commissioner, um, by advocates for, for the displaced and advocates for people who are being impacted by climate change. Fine, we understand it's happening, but again, we need to be moving more away from the rhetoric and to the action. Um, the, the Secretary General mentioned before that, um, well, basically in UNGA, that it has to be a priority for, for governments and multilateral organisations, and it can no longer be on the back burner. And so this then leads into what is UNHCR doing? And, and I'll just try and push this through as quickly as possible. And we can discuss it further um, offline if people are interested, but we have put in place a strategic framework of climate action. And I think what is key is, is not necessarily the three pillars, which are on the left-hand side, but the approach. It's about collaboration, and this is what Shafak and her team have been so importantly driving, is that we need to be working with parliamentarians, we need to be working with communities. We need, be, we need to be taking on um, what science and data is telling us. We, we can no longer be looking at the old ways of working. The old structures that have been established for years are no longer fit for looking with the challenges of the future. We need to be inclusive. We can't be saying decisions that are being made in New York or Geneva or Rome are the ones that are, will work best in the areas which our, our parliamentarian friends will be representing. And we need to be catalytic. We can no longer say it's just us. We, we've got a role and responsibility to bring the voices of those persons who have been displaced and their host communities to the front line in order to ensure that um, there's, a, there's an impactful and scalable response. So very briefly, we've, we've um, divided our, um, our approach into three areas, law and policy. And again, it's not necessarily looking to expand the 951 convention. We're looking to work with institutions and regional entities to see how um, legal uh, provisions and policy frameworks can support uh, and protect people being displaced. Uh, the second one is, is very much bread and butter for UNHCR. It's about how do we not only preserve and protect the environment in which refugees and, and displaced communities are located, but how do we also enhance their resilience to be dealing with the shocks that they're going to be experiencing in the future? It's the populations that are sharing the grief in Pakistan or, 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 or suffering the droughts in, in the Horn of Africa or elsewhere. So how do we not only provide increased and enhanced resilience to those populations, but also their host communities? And as Julian mentioned, how do we become smarter in how we do things? How do we move away from being a reactive organisation to one which understands the future 
and supports the governments and communities to make that difference. And the third point, some aspects which should be the simplest, how do we reduce our own environmental footprint? We've got 580 officers, we've got 4,000 generators, we've got about 6,000 vehicles, we've got 20,000 staff. So while we may want to be talking a lot about what others should be doing, the best way to make that difference is by, by demonstration that we're serious. And this is where we need the support and guidance of others. I'll just wrap up now because I know we need to push through, but we can make a difference with the support and working in a collective manner. We can um, change from using diesel generators to, um, to solar power. We can not only look at reducing the energy consumption, we can look at increasing the energy because it's about empowerment and, and energy is about empowering people. But we've got to be doing it in a much more sustainable manner. We can also ensure that we can preserve and protect the environment. And again, one of the sad things about the situation in Pakistan is that Pakistan has been at the forefront in terms of reforestation. And so how do we ensure that a lot of those gains are, are, are not lost? So um, we've mentioned um, the very much the global compact on refugees, looking at responsibility sharing, prevention, looking at root causes, um, adaptation in increasingly challenging and, and ho environmentally hostile locations. This is in, in Bangladesh. Um, but also we can all make a difference. And this is where it's important. Each and every one of us who are on the panels or who are on, on, on the, <laughs> involved with the webinar, what difference can we make? Not only to reducing our own impact, but how can we help those communities and those countries make a difference in terms of protection of the environment? So I think that's basically it. I'd just like to say thank you and I look forward to um, the discussions. Over. Thank you, Andrew, for putting in a nutshell this uh, huge dimension of displacement and the key, key dimensions, key angles to it uh, for further discussion by our panel. Uh, and speaking of Pakistan, we have also Honorable uh, Romina Kurshid Adam, a member of Parliament of Pakistan and convener for National Parliamentary Task Force on SDGs. If I may, please invite her for her remarks as well, as we know, Pakistan, as you have mentioned, Andrew, as well. Pakistan is currently experiencing uh, record-breaking and terrible, devastating floods that also cause uh, large-scale display displacement in the country. So, uh, Honorable uh, Alam, if you could enlighten us, what are the priority issues and some of your scene-setting comments and remarks and reflections, please? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I really want to say my regards to IPU, UNHCR, uh, UNHCR and all my honorable members from the different part of the uh, globe, uh, the member of the parliaments and the activists and whoever so is listening or being the part uh, of this uh, webinar, I really want to say my regards to them. Uh, first of all, as uh, and I really appreciate this, uh, the, the effort, kind effort of uh, the IPU, because this time it's, I believe it's a great need of the time that uh, we have to focus uh, on the floods as Pakistan is suffering. Uh, and I am really thankful to all those countries who have sent their condolences, they are sending their love, uh, in the form of uh, any sort of a help um, and with the prayers too, I really want to say thanks to them. Uh, now coming back to the subject, um, as recently we had a seminar, a regional seminar on uh, I, uh, along with IPU in Pakistan uh, with the Asia Pacific region. I, and as being the convener of SDGs and looking after the climate uh, change from last, uh, like I'm working as an activist too, but in my last term, because this is my second term in the parliament and before that I was also as the uh, parliamentary secretary on uh, climate change and this time as well I'm the standing committee member uh, on, the, uh, on the climate change and and by looking after SDGs and the climate change, of course, that's uh, uh, the priority as well. Because, you know, when we talk about the climate change, it's one of the subjects which covers all. Uh, it covers, uh, like, it can bring, like, impact on everyone. The impact of the global warming, the impact of the climate change come over to every person. Humans, of course, the living things, uh, the food security issues, so many issues are being into uh, uh, that. So we all, of course, are suffering. And as currently, when we talk about um, uh, this issue, the biggest issue of uh, 
<coughs> sorry, the biggest current issue of um, uh, the floods which Pakistan is suffering. So I want to bring in the notice of all of you that uh, this is not the first time. This is the second time because the before that in 2012 and then in 12, um, uh, 2022 again, Pakistan has been badly, badly been uh, suffered uh, uh, in this uh, flood situation, and because of the global warming. And then we talk when we talk about the refugees, when we talk about the migrations, when we talk about food security, the the poverty. I think this had affected badly, badly to all um, the society, all the people who are living in these areas. And of course, the migrations uh, among the uh, the provinces in in the country it's uh, going to be impact badly. Uh, and of course, the governance issues, of course, because um, as uh, before that, uh, the way uh, Mr. Pum, uh, the previous speaker was talking, excuse me, <coughs> excuse me. I would like to, while uh, Miss Alam... Hello? No, no, I, I got Hi. back. Hi, I'm back. Okay. I'm back. There was some issue on the net, so I just moved the place because that That's was okay. not the problem. I, for... I was just okay. wondering maybe some concrete, concrete uh, priority areas that you would actually address also the audience here on... Yes, on, okay. Or okay, I'm just telling... Uh, the support, first of all, I really believe that uh, we, this, when we talk about the legislation, I really want to request all the members uh, from the different parliaments of the globe, I just wanted to request that this is not someone's only one country issue. Now this is a global issue. So I think we all need to come up with a global uh, legislation because when we talk about the internet governors forums and different, I think this is something which is now we all have to get together and we have to discuss about it because the, the countries who are very vulnerable and who are not being the part of, uh, uh, they're not being the persons who have been the cause uh, of uh, the, this uh, calamities because I totally believe and we have all came across to know that the global warming and all the things have been not the natural disasters only. These are due to some, uh, of course, uh, responsible people uh, or the countries, the developed countries, because of them, few are suffering. So I think we come up, we should have to come up uh, with the three sort of a strategy in which one, uh, emergency strategy that if something happened, how we need to react em on emergency basis, and then the long term policies. And then the most important thing that the regional wise uh, uh, like uh, uh, networking groups in which one can come up with the climate issues, how we can sort it out, because it's very important because the way those provinces, um, uh, I'm sure you have gone through with that, uh, so many videos and so many things are going on on the uh, on internet and uh, uh, they are available. So I think with that, uh, we need to come up with the strategies because this time it's Pakistan, God forbid. This is the second time Pakistan is suffering. So I believe... God forbid, uh, no one else should suffer in this way. And if God forbid something happen, how we can going to uh, facilitate those things or how we can, oh, we're going to face those challenges. And then other than that, on top, we believe that this thing needs to, uh, we have requested in this seminar as well, that this thing should come up in the emergency agenda. And one thing, another, which I wanted to request, uh, and we are uh, uh, to my honorable members uh, from the different part of the parliaments, because I believe parliamentarians are the bridges among the countries. They can play a pivotal role uh, by achieving uh, our successes our, uh, uh, for the people because we are the people from the people, by the people and because of the people. And in that, because, you know, few countries who are suffering badly and they're in the vulnerable positions because of the few countries, I must say that when, then the word of aid should not be used for them. They should be get compensated in a proper and uh, in the proper way. So with this note, I just wanted to um, request that it should become in the on the emergency agenda of uh, this general assembly because I think it's very much needed because the globe needs us because all the parliamentarians are here and I think our legislation, our policy work can work because other than that, that cannot be done anything on mitigation or adaptation or on human rights because everything is belong to that. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Alam, uh, for also uh, connecting with us, joining us and depicting the situation, the gravity of the situation in Pakistan live with us, as well as your recommendations. Since you mentioned 
uh, several times as a recommendation to keep it at a global level as we are interconnected. I would like to turn to uh, Madame Chabot here, who has joined us uh, as a member of European Parliament, which is a regional parliament. So what could EU do to address the issue of climate change and displacement. Also your responses, please, uh, yes. and some of your reflections uh, in response to uh, uh, Ms. Alam, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, do you, yeah, thank you very much. Do you hear me? It's okay? Great. First of all, uh, many thanks to the Office of the United Nations I, uh, Commissioner for Refugees and the Interparliamentary Union for organizing this event, which I am honored to participate in today. I would like to, to, to say my deep thoughts to my colleague from Pakistan in this difficult moment that his people are going through. I'm a former sailor, co-founder uh, of the Ocean and Climate Platform in France, and today a member of the European Parliament and work in three commissions, Environment, Pesh and Development involved in this one on several topics, all ocean issues, adaptation, the Great Green Wall. And I want to highlight in the following months the topic of human displacement because of the impact of climate change. I will go straight to what concrete measures can the EU take. First, raise awareness. The EU, uh, through the work of its institutions, such as the one I am representing today, the European Parliament, has a crucial role to play. We, as elected member of parliaments, must address this issue. And this is why I have suggested an own initiative report in the Development uh, Committee on the impact of climate change on displacement for next year's parliamentary work, especially as countries most vulnerable to climate change and least ready to adapt are the source of 90% refugees and 70% internally displaced people. Second, develop a coherent policy to address migration in this context of climate change and natural disaster. And, and I was very interesting by the presentation uh, of Andrew Arpos. The EU and its member states play an active role in uh, promoting environmental protection in global fora, addressing environmental change and migration in humanitarian aid and development policies. However, in terms of international protection policies, no concrete initiatives have emerged. The dominant interpretation of the Geneva Convention relating to the status of refugees is that environmentally induced displacement alone does not meet the criteria for refugee protection. A first step could be to improve conceptual clarity by coming up with a common terminology and international status for these populations. The EU must also be proactive to prevent climate-induced migration. This means integrating in a traversal uh, manner throughout its policies in different areas, adaptation, mitigation components, in order to mitigate as early as possible the effects of climate change. This also means in the context of the NDICI Global Europe instrument aiming at financial assistance that truly takes into account programs that focus on strengthening resilience in the neighborhood. Third, learn from partner countries and their successful project. Stre stretching along the southern edge of the Sahara Desert from Senegal to Djibouti, the Great Green Roll Initiative is a great example of what can be done to prevent climate-induced migration. This ambitious project aims at restoring 100 million hectares of degraded land in the Sahel, while also preserving biodiversity, providing answers to the ever-growing challenges of climate change, soil degradation, food insecurity, access to energy, poverty, and unemployment as well as issues related to stability, security, and mobility in the Sahel region. And 
uh, at the One Planet Summit with a financial envelope of uh, 16 billion euros for the next five years, the Great Green Wall now needs to be supported in order to deliver and demonstrate the social, economic and environmental benefits it can bring to the science development. So the key is to learn from successful models that we can bring back to our own countries. In the first semester of next year, I will be organizing jointly with the vice president of the development committee, uh, my colleague Stefan Bijou, a high level conference at the European Parliament, which I would like to invite you all to take part in. And fourth, built upon SDGs. More broadly, I am truly convinced that sustainable development goals are a universal framework that can be applied by all stakeholders, whether governments, local authorities, or the private sector. As such, I am a great believer in the integrated reading of the SDGs, which allows for a transversal uh, vision of our policy public policies. And this can be illustrated throughout uh, two of my key missions at the European Par Parliament, making the Great Green Wall Initiative more visible and pushing for better ocean go governance. Uh, at the European level, I am a member of the SDG Alliance and an informal group of MEPs from different committees and political groups. And to conclude, my main message today is that there is an urgency to work together at an international level to exchange good practices and reinforce cooperation with countries that suffer most from the impacts of climate change. The European Parliament, national parliaments and international organizations such as the UNHCR must have a leading role in the future when addressing this issue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Chabot. And I would like to also remind uh, that our esteemed uh, speakers, uh, members of parliament, will have uh, also to keep it as much as interactive amongst them. I will turn back to them with different questions. Uh, but uh, next, I would like to also, we moved from a national disastrous situation that Ms. Alam has depicted for us and uh, with an urgent call and uh, Ms. Chabot from a regional perspective, regional parliamentary perspective, as well as with constructive, uh, constructive recommendations and imitation and good practices. I would like to turn to Ms. Saber from Egypt, uh, member of Egyptian parliament, serving also as the secretary general of the House uh, and Foreign Relations Committee. Egypt will host the upcoming COP27, which, which is a global event and uh, which will take place in less than, less than two months, actually. Uh, what do you think some of the some of the critical aspects, uh, Ms. Saber, uh, that of climate change, displacement, and human security that should be discussed at this upcoming event? That you are the focal point as well for IPU. Thank you. Thank you for uh, the question, and I'm very honored actually to be among this panel of experts, and I'm very glad to join you today to share with you, among other things, how can Egypt translate the UNHCR strategic national framework for climate action and translate it into laws. For your question about uh, the upcoming COP, I think COP is the right opportunity to do two main things. Framing climate change as a global and a human security crisis, other than just a natural disaster, and bringing back or actually put forward the discussion on climate-related migration to the COP's agenda. During the uh, past conferences of the state parties, discussion on the climate-related displacement has been at the margin mostly brought by like civil society expert groups at the side events, but absent from the negotiation table and rarely mentioned by the member states. So it's, I know it's a very heavy discussion, but we can't really afford delaying it much further. According to one projection by the World Bank, it's that more than 216 million people will migrate internally by 2050 if no sound climate action was intact. And 100 millions of them are from where? Are from Africa, which is my continent. So in that regard, I think two issues are worth discussing at this event. We need to define climate refugees and to recognize them as a protected category entitled to all the rights and uh, the privileges. 
According to the Norwegian Refugees Council, every second one person is displaced by a natural disaster. And we have heard from uh, the colleague uh, from uh, Pakistan about how this is serious the situation is. We are talking about 10 million uh, and estimated migrations at Pakistan. Recognizing the climate migrants as climate migrants shouldn't be a matter of national interest, but it should be a matter of a human right. And here it comes. We need to fill the void in the international legal system. And COP is a very good opportunity to recommend taking this matter to the Human Rights Council for consideration, to amend the 1951 Refugee Convention. And we should advise that the countries should incorporate the climate-related reasons as part of their definitions nationally. We also to address urgently the this appropriate effects of climate change on the poor and the middle income countries. Needless to say that they haven't really contributed that much to the uh, climate crisis, but they are paying the price in full. So as I mentioned earlier, around half of the expected internal displacement will happen in Africa. Populations in Africa generally suffer low socioeconomic uh, development and they are much prone to climate impacts because of their geographic vulnerabilities. They have limited avenues for legal migration and they do suffer from water scarcity. I'll talk about my country where, you know, we have conflicts over water. Uh, this is uh, plus what is actually uh, happening at the Mediterranean uh, base. So uh, what, we, what we really need to do is to bring this issue to the table, uh, uh, on, the, on the table of the negotiations, on the broad table of ne negotiations at COP. And I think Egypt is very much determined to lead the voice of African countries on that during the upcoming COP, uh, given that Africa has contributed the least, as I have uh, mentioned. Um, in my capacity as a member of the parliament, actually, I'm working internally on uh, a draft of a bill that targets climate action, climate change action, Egypt, and uh, which is actually nationalizing the uh, laws and regulations regarding the big topics in climate change. Uh, that's besides an, an, a bill which I have already introduced to the parliament. Uh, regarding food waste, and I see that food waste is closely related to food security and uh, it is part of the uh, climate action. Uh, this is regarding your question about what I do expect uh, should be changing in the scene during the upcoming COP. Thank you very much for these reflections and responses actually uh, to, to some of the uh, comments that were made by your counterparts, fellow uh, MPs uh, previous to you. So you brought us also to the continent. I mean, you made these connections with the human rights as well as the, uh, including the food security, security angle, but also brought us to the challenges particular to the African continent. I would like to turn to a member of parliament from Uganda, Ms. Nakimero, uh, who is uh, a champion in the parliament uh, and shadow minister for water and environment, as well as serving on the parliamentary climate change committee. Um, certainly, if you could please, um, honorable member, uh, walk us through the challenges that are being faced in Uganda in that context, be it landslides and floodings that are major risks, um, and uh, especially countries, mountain regions. So what are some of the challenges being faced by people who have been displaced by these um, particularly climate-induced uh, issues? And um, also, what are the impacts in terms of economy and livelihoods. Uh, greetings to you all. First of all, I'm very grateful to IPU, which is the primary uh, connection between Ugandan Parliament and uh, and uh, other stakeholders, UNHCR and PHAF, PHAP. Thank you very much for putting us together. Um, I am happy to be here. And um, based on the parliamentarians, major interest, uh, we, we take displacement as like a, uh, supporting displacement would be option number three. As members of parliament, we are not re representing vacant areas. We are not happy to represent vacant areas that people are displaced and so you remain a member of parliament for just empty places. So we come from that other background, that I must continue representing people 
in parliament, representing cultures, representing identity in parliament. So the fact that we are uh, removing people from a certain place is a serious issue to members of parliament. We would not like our people to leave. So we have to first expedite a solution to these causes that take away people. Because currently in Uganda, people are leaving their original places due to such of uh, uh, Rakhzariant pasture. They are also living in such of uh, arable land and any disasters, including especially flooding, landslides, and um, also loss of fertility. We have also a lot of invasion by wild game. It is becoming common in Uganda due to climate change. So can you first of all, exhaust efforts to reduce the occurrence of this to the people. And then if we have exhausted the options, can we then prepare the host communities? Because for example, the district I represent, I am a host community to pastoralists who feel their pastures are worn out and they should come to my district to find refuge for their livestock. So, but as host communities, how are we prepared to host these people's gender attributes, for example, to host their cultures? Much of the emphasis has been put on the displaced populations. As the hosts are not prepared, especially in terms of building our resilience to accommodate these, the new people, you are aware that in addition to legislature oversight representation, budgetary role, members of parliament were tasked to fundraise for our people, to identify resources, to bring in opportunities for the people we represent. So the people will always ask you, what have you brought for us? And what you can only say is a new population from this other place that is seeking uh, Raxarian pasture. And then they're like, how is this one adding on to us? How is it building our resilience as well? So. Looking at the host communities would be plan B. And then that is when we would move to, to, to the uh, relocation part of it. And so currently the capacities, we need definitions of the capacities of the host communities. How many should we accept? What population should be accepted to maintain the resilience at, at balance? because we do not want to shift the vulnerability from the disaster prone areas to host communities. It will not be sustainable, but we'd like to have a long lasting situations because that actually even the, the, the members of parliament who represent the, 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 the relocating communities are facing a challenge. The constituents have not been carved out of the politics of the country. So, you, you are representing an empty space because the geographical location is still a political uh, geography. And that is why when your population is taken somewhere, they keep coming back to, for example, grow crops and you know, adherence to some standards in uh, prone areas is not there. So we are saying after uh, exhausting the options or for example, maintaining soil fertility, work on the vermins to ensure that people don't leave. But I see people just start moving away, even sometimes before we have resolved on issues. And then we get so sympathetic to the moving populations to the extent that we do not want to know where they are going, which to, to us as members of parliament is very, very important. And then, so we need to weigh the investment. If you are, uh, investing in the host community versus the, the displaced people. What is the ratio? What should be the ratio? It, it should be a two-way uh, decision because as where you are going, there's a member of parliament. Where you are coming from is a member of parliament. What language do you speak to you two uh, representatives? And then we also look at uh, the, the interested other interested parties. 
and a mechanism through which we convey our messages. It is important at this moment to include the foresight, the anticipated occurrences, uh, the weather forecasts at this moment are very important to us members of parliament, such that when we are deciding on the next move, we are prepared in order to cater for the, for the three sets I've talked about. The host community, the population that is going to be replaced, and also the actions in there. So weather forecasting is very important at the moment. Because even people who opt to remain do not know what to do. Uh, they are not, uh, their capacities are not appropriate. And uh, as if the focus is to, uh, like I've said, the, the same person, the people moving is uh, uh, leading, leading everything, leading the decision, leading the investment, which I feel is, uh, is firefighting. So we, we do have, uh, uh, the members of parliament who subscribe to the IPU. And these are selected based on uh, political affiliations, but not uh, probably, they may not have the uh, background, the climate change saga within the respective countries. I'm requesting if there are gatherings uh, of this nature, please involve us such that in the discussions of the displacement, climate change, find a, a, a slot, a position, because based on what we are undergoing, almost most of the internal, internal, internal displacements are due to climate change, other than the external ones, but most internal displacements currently are due to climate change effects. But uh, the way we are, we, are, we are handling, I think us, the members of parliament, have a certain view from the professionals with that other uh, connotation of the representation and oversight role of parliament. So we come with some other uh, view of addressing uh, the displacements as option C compared to being option A. Thank you. Like Kimero, thank you very much for also sharing with us the social cohesion issues uh, when it comes to host communities and, and internal displaced uh, persons. So I would like to, on that front, I would like to also turn to Honorable Jabir from Chad, a member of parliament uh, of Chad and chair of the standing committee on sustainable development. Um, so um, in the Lake Chad region, uh, Mr. Jabir, thank you very much for being with us as well today. Uh, there is the climate change and conflict is very much linked and it leads to large scale display, displacement. Would you like to enlighten us on, on, on the situation on the ground uh, in terms of Chad, as well as your recommendations? Euh, merci, madame. Je voudrais tout d'abord féliciter l'UIP. Thank you very much. I would like to congratulate uh, the IPU for this initiative, which enables us to exchange and to share our experience. As a point in fact, the because Chad is um, corresponds to all these criteria because we have refugees, we have uh, people displaced uh, population, and then we have other population groups as well. In Chad, as you know, we have three different zones. We have the southern zone with refugees from um, Central Africa with the violence, uh, in the northern part of um, cent um, Central Africa, we also have the internally displaced uh, because of floods, but also uh, because of the virus, uh, which uh, and because of the violence, I think. Uh, in the eastern part, we have the refugees from Sudan who are um, more than 400,000, so about 70% of all the refugees we are hosting. And in the western part, around Lake Chad, 
we have a, a very difficult humanitarian situation. So these populations are exposed to um, attacks of uh, non-state um, armed groups. So this situation leads us to say that in Chad, in September 2021, we had about 1 million and 50,000 people displaced, displaced. And in the various zones I just mentioned, which is the eastern part, the western part, and the southern part of the country, the relationship between these populations is a source of conflict because because we have displaced people, we have um, host communities and refugees. So these communities were already quite vulnerable and they are directly impacted by uh, climate change as well. So there's a very close link. So they are in a situation of increased vulnerability, the host community. So what do we do as parliamentarian, which means representing the population? So we should play a key role in that situation. First of all, our traditional role, which is to uh, watch uh, the budget closely. So in this budget, we have programs dedicated to this population. So we, first of all, we have to uh, make sure that these budgets are properly spent. For example, PACA, which is a program dedicated to these target groups and also additional programs at the government level, and we need to follow up uh, the implementation of this program. So this is why at parliament, we have a, a mission uh, in these um, various regions. So we had a program with the um, UNHCR to go to the different sites to um, look at the situation in the field, to look at what was achieved, but also to collect the opinion of the population and to uh, look into uh, this situation at the level of parliament and to discuss it with the government to come up with recommendations. As you can see here, this is the nexus, humanitarian change, uh, climate change and development. Uh, this is what needs to be coordinated. And this is at this level that, uh, um, in terms of budget, as I said, we need to be very uh, attentive and look into what can be done at the level of the um, government budget to uh, strengthen the resilience of this target population, as well as their adaptation to climate change. I think it's an important point. The uh, other point is also, in terms of legislation, as you know, we have uh, laws and regulations covering these various aspects, and this must be uh, taken into account. This is why at the National Assembly in Chad, we um, decided on new laws, especially laws for these populations to be integrated into um, to become active, to become more active uh, and to uh, comply with the local laws and to uh, embark in uh, income generating activities or any other activities. The other aspect is also, um, is also awareness raising and uh, with the government, but also the other partners of Chad with uh, this advocacy, uh, for example, the World Bank, 
CBLT, United Nations, UNHCR, etc. I think this work is something we do when we follow very closely what is happening in the field. Another point is the relationship between the uh, parliament networks. I'm representing the National Assembly in the uh, commission of the uh, Lake Chad Basin. And as such, we are working together with uh, other colleagues. And this is in this framework that we work on uh, legislative text, but also on harmonizing text, legal text, uh, because we need to share resources. As I said, we have popular problems between this population also because of the resource sharing as well as because of climate change, which uh, forced people to move. And so this has to be um, tackled at a regional level as well, because as you know, the issues are um, usually the same. And so we need to exchange our experience with our colleagues in the uh, the African region. And this is why in the network of um, African uh, MPs, uh, this is what we discussed, but this is also a global issue. And this is why at the uh, COP meetings, we um, ask uh, the question and we discuss these issues, um, for example, as a side events of the COP. The last meeting was in Glasgow, where we um, had a very strong, um, very strong presence. And here in Chad, uh, we have a national NGO, which is part of this uh, process and working to be a real partner in terms of climate change in Chad. So the relationship between uh, parliamentarians on the national, uh, regional, but also international level is important to tackle all these issues, which are a major concern. Because today, the population with um, the situation, for example, floods, uh, so uh, all these um, diseases, etc., people displacement, etc. This is something which needs to be taken into account because otherwise the next years to come will be even harsher. And this is why we need to um, you need to take measure and uh, we need to protect our population to help them uh, get out of this uh, situation. We need to make them more resilient uh, to address the major challenges uh, which are expecting us. And I think parliamentarians have a very important role to play in that respect. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Jaber, uh, with very concrete and uh, concrete recommendations, actually, also complementing your fellow MPs um, with, with the functions of parliament, parliamentarians uh, from different dimensions, uh, including and highlighting budgetary allocations, the importance of it, as well as parliamentary working in a region with parliamentary networks, sharing similar uh, problems and, and the importance of sharing solutions that one may help with another country that shares the similar problems. Um, before we go around with another round uh, with our esteemed MP speakers, I would like to turn to Andrew for, her, for his uh, initial uh, reflections on what we have heard so far. Okay, thanks Shafak and, um, and sincere thanks to, um, to the panelists. I think what is, um, on the positive side is just the reinforcement of how important um, climate displacement is on the agenda, not only of the national parliaments that have, that have so far spoken, but also of the EU. Um, this is a far cry to what it was um, even two or three or four years ago. And it's particularly important 
as um, our colleague from uh, from Pakistan said, um, going in as well as from Egypt said, um, going into COP twenty seven, where we need to be ensuring that there is a human element on the agenda, because if we're talking about loss and damage, it's often too easy just to be talking about the physical infrastructure or about um, elements which are not personable. Um, but we're talking about human lives here, and we're talking about, um, as was stated, one person per second um, or one displacement per second uh, of people being uh, impacted. And so this is only likely to um, grow as the intensity of extreme weather events um, bite. So we need to be doing more in terms of not only the, um, the global um, legal architecture, but very much the national architecture. And there's already a lot of um, elements going forward on that. Um, Catherine mentioned the, the need for conceptual clarification in terms of the legal identification of people who have been displaced. Um, the 51 Convention is very clear. And in the current context, I, I, I dare say that it's going to be very difficult to get multilateral agreements to look at um, an instrument which would, which would enhance um, internationally uh, the provision of protection for people uh, forced to move to natural hazards. But what we're seeing more and more, whether it be through the OAU or through the Cartagena Declaration, or even uh, national initiatives that are taking place in, um, in Argentina, for instance, we're seeing national legislation, we're seeing national parliaments recognising the, the challenges not only existing in, within their states, but in their regions and are stepping forward uh, to ensure that protection is there. Um, the framing of the global um, crisis with a human security uh, lens is also particularly important and ensuring that uh, these elements are put under the negotiating table. So I'm coming out of the, out of the discussion, Shafak, with a, with a new sense of, um, of hope um, because, the, because while it's heartbreaking seeing the images of, um, um, of the droughts and the floods, um, it is, it's reassuring to see that we have such solid parliamentarians representing their communities, as well as uh, what I'm hearing in being very inclusive in terms of ensuring that those people who have been displaced are taken into account um, in their uh, discussions and in their plans and policies. Uh, so that's basically where it is now. Um, host communities, resilience, much more work needs to be done moving towards COP27, uh, but even more so, how do we ensure that the, the plans are in a, in, a, in a holistic manner so that we can support national governments, who can support the communities, but also how do we become more of a catalyst to ensure that the resources get to where it's needed? It's quick intervention, over. Thank you, Andrew, for that quick intervention. It's also uh, related to some of the questions that were posed in the chat by our participants uh, as Andrew followed them and tried to answer here uh, through this intervention. I would like to turn to uh, our esteemed guest speakers once again and, um, and perhaps to have a follow-up before we close this webinar um, to have their concluding remarks as well as um, one more follow-up question perhaps. Uh, Ms. Saber, we keep speaking about COP27 and the House of Representatives of Egypt uh, and the IPU are co-organizing co uh, a parliamentary meeting that will bring together the global parliamentary community. So what opportunities does this meeting would provide? Speaking of challenges, speaking of solutions, and now I would like to ask you about the opportunities that the world's parliaments to address pressing climate change issues including displacement. Is there any space? What kind of opportunities will be created by this global platform? Yeah. This is a very important question for each one who's hearing us now, every parliamentarian, uh, because I believe parliaments are key players in any climate action. They draft and pass laws, finance projects, allocate budget, and they also oversee the government policies. Uh, and they definitely approve the international agreements, appoint various heads of administrative and expert bodies, and they represent the various interests of their communities. So these traditional roles of the parliamentary parliamentarians, they are exactly the tools we have at our disposal to fight against climate change. 
We are talking here about lawmaking that compels both public and private sector to cut their greenhouse emissions, which in uh, the African countries, for example, is something that is not very easy, talking about the developmental component, which comes also with the industrial aspect and the greenhouse emissions. So uh, the budget financing for green infrastructure and economy is one very important thing, the resilience, the ability to translate the international obligations to national laws. And here it comes, because as per my knowledge, there is still a very big room to go, uh, crucial steps to be taken to translate the international com commitments to national law. And I think it's, it's an area where there is a very big gap. And also, it's very, very important, talking about youth as well, being one of the youth, to bring the voices of the youth on the table. I still see that youth are underrepresented. And uh, I, I think during the upcoming COP, the voices of the, the youth, the women, the uh, girls, immigrants, the ethnic minorities, the human rights defenders, and all the other like vulnerable or marginalized groups, they should be on the table sitting with the different governor, governments and actually uh, voicing their concerns and voicing their interests. I think this meeting, uh, which is uh, going to be held by the IBU during COP, is a very important one because also the need of knowledge sharing in climate action uh, me, myself, when I attended some of the climate parliament sessions, it has, uh, it has enhanced my knowledge well about what has been done uh, at the other countries. And it was actually a driving force to think about uh, a drafting a legislation that fills the gap in my country. So this kind of connecting parliamentarians together is, is really inspiring and is really important. We know climate change is not a simple issue. Ignored scientific advices has been there for years, so we need to bring back to the table the evidence-based policy making, uh, the evidence base which has uh, been actually implemented in the countries to develop over the knowledge of each other. Uh, we need this meeting because we need to listen to the experience of the leading countries also on how they incorporated climate action in their laws and policies. One thing that I, I really hope that this meeting will be long on uh, prescription, but short on description. We really need such thing to go directly to implement, to have the bridges being done and to force the parliamentary or actually encourage the parliamentarians from all over the world to force their countries to fulfill this, to align, to uh, show their respect to what they have actually drafted or agreed upon. So we need to hear a lot on the different policy-oriented, uh, actionable approaches to climate change in law. Should there be any one comprehensive law that addresses all the climate concerns or not? Because I think it's not. We are still developing our uh, legislative knowledge towards the issues of climate change. Also, should climate lawsuits be recognized or not? Should the private sector be subject to climate legislation or not? Should we incorporate regional commitments in these laws? Should the climate change establish a, a scientific body or a governmental body? So all these questions I think is very important and should be raised uh, on such a panel. There are a few examples that I thought of uh, in the top of my mind, but I'm pretty sure that this meeting will be an excellent opportunity for climate law and policy experts to share their views for the countries uh, they are seeking to incorporate climate action into laws. Um, I, I want here to refer to what happened during COP and how the collective parliamentary action from all over the world brought us uh, easily through this uh, crisis. In, in my opinion, it was a real success and we need to capitalize on such international, uh, international challenge which we faced during COVID to uh, actually get the learned lessons and apply it again on the uh, climate change crisis. On that point, uh, I'm, current, I'm currently working as I, I, as I have uh, uh, said to you on a draft, a comprehensive law on climate action in Egypt, and it is actually driven by such conversations with other parliamentarians from all over the world. And I'm certainly after this discussion on COP, uh, which the IPU is going to hold, it's incorporating the elements of human security and displacement. I'd also be glad to uh, receive any feedback and to add such component to the draft, which I am finalizing and working on now. Thank you.
Thank you very much for those also concluding remarks and also on the way forward uh, that you um, brought us through uh, the upcoming COP. Uh, we also trust in your in your uh, championship, uh, Ms. Saber, uh, that uh, that displacement angle will be co- included, which is sometimes really excluded from the debates even. Um, forget about the legislation and the budget allocations. But, we um, need all the valuable 500 champions here in the room as well. Exactly. So that is our call then. Uh, thank you very much. Very concretely answered. And uh, Honorable Alam, if I may turn to you also with, an, uh, with a question that came from the floor from our participants. Um, how is the monitoring and evaluation component of SDG framework coordinated such that impact of intervention is measured at country and global level, since you are uh, very much uh, convening and focusing your work on the SDGs implementation. And if I may also ask for your concluding remarks, particularly on how do you manage in the existing um, policies on climate change that have influenced what is occurring now in Pakistan and are there any lessons learned from the current experience um, that parliaments should consider in their future responses? Thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, once again. And uh, first of all, I'm really, uh, it was a great learning session uh, listening from other, my uh, fellow parliamentarians. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, well, as you talk about the SDGs, how we are doing the monitoring, I just wanted to tell you that Pakistan, of course, uh, we have the, uh, Pakistan's parliament is the first ever parliament who had a proper secretariat uh, for SDGs in which we have engaged all the member of the parliaments and then are all proper provinces and two legislative assemblies. So we all, in all provinces, we have uh, the uh, proper parliamentarians committee. And then the, on the local uh, grounds as well, we are, we have, of course, we believe in the localization. In that we have the dashboard systems in which we generate all the data as we are trying together and we are working on that and we are trying our level best uh, to come up um, and to face the challenges. But unfortunately, with this current flood situation, I believe the things which we somehow we got uh, uh, in high in numbers, um, again, we are going badly bad uh, or low. Uh, again, as we are going to see, the poverty level is going to be very high. Uh, and then especially I want to highlight as UNSHR and other country fellow, my parliamentarians are here, the, own, the most vulnerable in this situation is the woman and the children who are suffering. Because if we talk about the hygiene issues, you know, the women, they don't have any places, the washroom issues, the toilet issues, the menstrual hygiene issues, you know, and the uh, gynecal uh, doctor's uh, support system, it's too, uh, it's too pathetic. And then the biggest challenge after the, this water is going to, the flood water is going to be settled, the more uh, painful thing will become not, like it's been started, the health issues like with the malaria, dengue, um, measles, and so much more, uh, God forbid, is coming on. So, of course, we need the uh, prayers as well. But more than the prayers, I believe we need to work on uh, we are trying our level best uh, to gather all and to engage much more uh, on the health things and other issues we are trying. And then if you talk about uh, the legislation side, we are that, I've, as I've urged uh, and uh, requested to all that we should come up with the networking uh, issues, networking, sorry, groups, uh, or you can say the way we, we can learn from each other best practices. And when we talk about, because I propose this, uh, because I think it's not one country's issue now that one is suffering another can come and do the help. Now we have to do this. Every country has to do it for ourselves. So as being the convener of SDGs uh, from Pakistan, I'm trying my level best to connect with my other fellow parliamentarians from other countries. Those are regional, uh, you know, to support each other, to look forward for support each other and to come up with a strategy and mechanism where we can not only support, we can work with each other. We can learn from the best practices because, you know, the the economy suffered a lot. Uh, Of course, the world Bank is supporting, UNFCR are supporting, UNICEF is supporting other organizations. But we have to th- think about it that how we have to come up with a proper final legislation, which, because my concern is again and again, and to be very honest, Shafak, I believe to uh, rather to go in different, different small pockets, it's much better to work in the big forum and to hammer the big things that it, it can bring a proper impact, not for today 
for our tomorrow because me you or may, maybe my few other colleagues maybe we have 20 years 30 years to live but what about those children who are going to suffer more and more because i'll tell you my soul cries i and i'm sure you all have seen those videos or pictures where there was a mother who have delivered a baby in the flood water and the child was being alone helpless with his umbilicus he was like you know the placenta he was under the soil he was somehow being alive but he lost his mother where that woman has been gone so you know this is a question on on all of us because we as a parliamentarian we are answerable we as a parliamentarian we can do the wonders for our people i always believe that we are the ones uh, who can while if we can join the hands we can do the wonders and this is my request to all of you uh, i don't know how to say but yes we need to have a support of each other because the pain the people are going through that is miserable there is no match to it no matter what we can do they don't care for the money they don't have shelters they don't have home they have lost the children have lost their parents the women they have lost there are because you know in these areas most of the women they even don't uh, know how to go outside you know they are from a very conservative families so they have lost their roof so this is my request to all that for heaven's sake climate change is the subject where all things can be sorted out but only it can be happen that when we are going to be together i'm sorry for me but yeah thank you thank you very much for your sincere remarks uh, romina uh, honorable alam uh, is is very important for us to hear your voice uh, representing millions in pakistan so and and we heard your very concrete also request from all to stand in solidarity to resolve this situation otherwise it's not possible we are um in fact our minds and hearts uh, are with with pakistan um and i would like to turn thank you um i would like to turn quickly also to our because we are running out of our time uh, but our gracious uh, interpreters who uh, actually agreed to extend the time for a few more minutes i would like to turn to ms nakimbero and also uh, mr jabesh for their concluding remarks as well as their requests their uh, recommendations for the action by parliamentarians thank you yes honorable dakimero uh, floor is yours you would re in favor okay um thank you very much for the opportunity um we we are leaving this uh discussion but with commitment as members of parliament to first of all work on the issues that may spur displacement fast we have to invest a lot in um, weather forecasting at the moment and first exhaust all the efforts we have that can really render our population stay where they are and then after that we are also looking at the possible relocations the possible geographical areas and preparing their resilience to receiving these enormous populations to be able to cater for the gender attributes that these populations come with but we need to come up with indicators of uh, appropriate readiness to receive because we do not want to shift vulnerability from one place to another and then that is when we can help our populations and be able to represent their issues represent the issues of the areas where our populations came from represent the issues in the new relocations and represent the issues of the displaced people we are ready as members of parliament to utilize this cop 27 and also in the prior discussions uh, organized by climate parliament to ensure that uh, actually the displacement the internal displacements due to climate change effect is reduced thank you so much thank you very much uh, honorable nakimero for very concrete recommendation and commitment from your end as well um honorable jabir may i invite you to to take the floor please we oui. oui, merci beaucoup yes thank you very much Once again, 
I would like to tell you that the members of parliament has an important role to play. And as you know, these people, whether they are refugees or internally displaced people, they've lost uh, their way to earn money to, to live. So the question of food safety, the the fact that they lost their land, that how the, the livelihood and these are the issues, and we also have floods and droughts, and facing a vast array of problems. So in Chad, so we have a program for this that try to consider all the various factors, climate change, development. So we have a framework. And if, if it's implemented correctly, we can reduce the, the impacts, the shocks, the consequences of these shocks. And we have various uh, factors to consider, various shocks. So we are a poor country and we need to rely on the support of our partners and the MPs are here to monitor and to check if the, the, the support has been uh, given to the population. And it implies that that the populations should be more resilient. They should be uh, responsible, they should be empowered, but they must be able to face the many challenges. And this is why, thanks to the support of all our partners, I think we need to work together and we need to strengthen the, the, the relationships among uh, the, the MPs. So on the regional level, so we have a framework so we can meet and we can discuss. But on the, in Africa and on the international level, we can share the best practices and this is extremely important and this is how we can uh, tackle these challenges by uh, uh, having laws to protect, legislations to protect these people, so we can protect and support these populations. This is our job as MPs, so we need to support these tasks. So for the, uh, the SDG committee, we are here to support these MPs, these members of parliament, so we can see uh, how are the budgets, are they adequate to tackle these challenges. So, of course, we know that uh, we had to stop everything because of COVID, but we need to pay attention to the good implementation of these policies. It was struggling a bit with this, but in our parliament, we worked with the government. So to know what what, uh, the, what were the success and the uh, the achievements in the country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Jaber, for sharing your wisdom and also very very strong commitments um, and linking it uh, with partnerships. Um, so on that front, I would like to turn to our special advisor on climate action. Uh, Mr. Andrew Harper, for concluding words, I leave the floor to you to close uh, this discussion. It's been most stimulating to hear the voices of parliaments uh, from the members themselves. Thank you, Andrew. Over to you. Okay, thanks, Shafak. And um, I, I know that we have, um, uh, have gone over our time, so I would just like to say thank you to very much to the parliamentarians. Um, but what this needs to be is not just a one-off event. We need to be sort of seeing um, how can we have this, this partnership reinforced over time. And something which I have also been um, doing is just sort of going through all the, um, all the elements which have been included in the chats in terms of um, the concerns and suggestions from really all over the world. And I think what this um, presentation has shown is just how parliamentarians are really the link to communities on the ground. And while I appreciate that there are some parliaments which work well and some which work less well, um, the thing is that there are representatives and we need to be uh, working hand in glove with these representatives in order to ensure that the communities on the ground 
can have their voices heard and to ensure that those communities take into account uh, those people, the displaced persons that are there. Um, because in the end, as is repeatedly said, but not necessarily implemented, uh, we need to not only listen to the, um, the populations on the ground, but we need to ensure that they can identify locally led solutions um, that work in their interests uh, and are sustainable. But to all the panelists, uh, to Shafak, uh, to the IPU, and to everyone who joined us, uh, just sincere and genuine gratitude to each and every one of you for the work, the interest uh, that you have put into this. And may this continue to um, lead to a more impactful, um, I don't want to say solution because that's probably too, <laughs> too ambitious, but um, that we can work to a more, uh, towards a more common agenda on how to address these issues. Um, because as, as we all said, uh, it's the most vulnerable who are going to take the biggest hit from um, the, 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 the situation that's going to be um, increasingly exacerbated by, uh, by this increasingly hostile climate. So again, thank you very much. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to be here.